Network of Orange County, and we are the hosting nonprofit welcoming you to Southern California for the FLFC Expo. And I want to thank you on behalf of Brad and Candy for trekking all the way here to find answers. And so I want to be a resource to you, and I want to get your questions answered. So as we go through FLFC 101, and our organization has existed in Orange County. We've been uh, affiliated with two other organizations, and now we have our own organization. We just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Let's give it up for 10 years of supporting people in our area. Now, when I say Orange County, we're not exclusive. 20% of our members come from San Bernardino, Riverside, San Diego, LA, um, all the way up to the Santa Barbara County, and we've had people come as far as Nevada and Hawaii to come to our programs because we have 30 programs that we run out of our small nonprofit. And we have a program night every single month where we have a symposium style um, event for our members where we have an adult <laughs> epileptologist and a pediatric epileptologist talk. So we've created something that our members told us what they needed. So it really is of the people, by the people, for the people. Because you are the epilepsy experts, and we take in all this information, we're the clearinghouse, we put it all together, and we figure out, okay, so we've got 200 people that are in need of this. We've had 2,000 people that are in need of this. And we pull all the information together, and we make the best possible decisions for the entire team. And basically, all the families are saying the same thing. They want support, they want compassion, they want expertise, and everyone wants hope, right? So, and that's why you're here. So, let's get started. So, just talked about who we are. And we are committed to building a community of support to improve the lives of those affected by epilepsy through education programs and advocacy. And when we advocate, um, we are creating our community of support for people to be sensitive, to be more toler tolerant, to be more open and understanding about epilepsy. So while we're helping families, we have a dual responsibility of educating our community and helping them understand the plight of epilepsy and what families are going through because they have no idea. Still we hear from people and, uh, and families saying, well at least you can't die from epilepsy and you take medication. And we then drop everything and educate them about the reality of epilepsy. So I hope to think that we're kind of eons ahead and when we compare the needs of other communities, Oh, I have to stay here for the camera. camera yeah. Oh, you just told me about a camera. Now I might get nervous. There's only like 9,000 people. Okay, on that's it. Other that's side it. Of the I'm camera. good. I'm good. <laughs> just going to put this here. Okay. Okay. Just attach it and put it like here somewhere. I'll do it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so. We are trying to accomplish all the necessary things for people with epilepsy. And how do we do that? People ask us all the time. How do you run all your programs? How do you keep going through the fight? Because epilepsy is many times more complicated than other conditions because we are so far behind the curve, but we're roaring forward because people like Brad and Candy put on this event that brings us all together and we share information and collectively we can move farther faster and that's why we we are all here so how we do it is we fight urgently for people with epilepsy because we understand that the condition one seizure can cause another seizure that can cause another seizure and once the brain um, 
gets used to having seizures, it becomes epileptogenic. So the race is on, folks. We need to get seizure-free as soon as possible, okay? So if you're seeing any specialists out there that they don't have an urgency, and in our organization, if you go to our website, it says, we urgently help families find relief from seizures because there is an urgency. Um, you're learning about SUDEP, you're learning about the death rate, and you're learning about what seizures do to the brain. So we can't lose seconds when we're fighting this condition. And when we have the urgency and we have the passion, and we go into our community and we passionately advocate for people with epilepsy, the number one word here is passion, okay? So we want you to talk about epilepsy, okay? I give all of my audiences, and our organization does over 100 presentations a year, and last year we advocated um, to 15,336 15, um, community members, and we taught them about epilepsy. And when you passionately advocate and you tell them your story and you share your story, what we do is we give them homework after the presentation. We say, go into your groups, whether it is your you know, um, group of friends, your work group, your church group, your book club, if you belong to a service club, wherever you are, talk about epilepsy. Because we're not going to make the strides that we can make unless you talk about epilepsy. So every conversation you should be talking about your loved one with epilepsy and the impact it has. Because then you give someone permission to talk about their epilepsy. And what you're going to find is, oh, my grandson had epilepsy, or my aunt had epilepsy, and she passed from epilepsy, and we didn't talk about it. So you're going to help people tell their story by telling your story. And that's what we need to do as a world, as a nation, and from all of the places that you have come from. Now, we talk about it all the time in Orange County, and everyone will say, oh, there's that crazy epilepsy lady. And Jen Gunther is here, and she's one of our original founders. Stand up, Jennifer. And she's the other crazy epilepsy lady. So if you talk to her, she's going to tell you her epilepsy story. But that is what we needed to do. And because if you don't talk about epilepsy and share the impact that it has on your family, people don't know your story. And we need to share our stories. So that is my first statement for um, Epilepsy 101 and advocating for epilepsy. So when we go in the community, we do Epilepsy 101, we do seizure recognition and first aid, and we go into all the schools in Orange County and we teach the teachers and the aides and all the staff how to respond to seizures. And not only do we do that, we sensitize them and we show them seizures and we talk about the families and what the families are dealing with. So not only can they help the child, but they can help the family and support the family and understand what the family's going through and look at it through our eyes. You know, they now can see that an epilepsy diagnosis permeates the entire family and the entire community. So that's why we all need to be working together as one to improve the condition for epilepsy. And I can tell you, the good news is, 22 years ago, when my daughter was diagnosed, there was no epilepsy expo. There, were, there wasn't even an epilepsy center in Orange County, so we were trekking all over the United States trying to find a doctor who would take something seriously, and it was miserable, it was isolating, and it cost a lot of money, and it took a toll on our family and my husband and my relationship, and everyone thought, well, you're just not doing it right because you don't have these seizures under control. What are you doing wrong? So even your family members and your best friends think you can't figure it out. Well, it's not that we couldn't figure it out. There was no collective group who was saying the same thing about epilepsy. Everyone had a different story about epilepsy. So, so many of our families came together and they advocated for better care and they advocated for um, conferences and they advocated for parent groups and they advocated for an epilepsy center and this um, grassroots to grass top advocacy has gotten us an epilepsy center of our dreams for pediatrics okay so we have three epilepsy centers now in Orange County which is marvelous because on any given day there might be one there might be none there might be another one popping up but we didn't have a continuity of care so we all work together and we move people from isolation 
into empowerment by catapulting them through with the answers that they need. They need to find a specialist, we help them. We have our intake and referral. They need to um, help with parenting tips, we have uh, professionals. They need help with IEP, we can help them with that. So first and foremost, it's getting the seizure stopped because it can be so damaging. And anytime death is a side effect, you've got to take that seriously. And we take it seriously, and our doctors take it seriously. So we're very urgent. And I'm telling you, you have to have an urgency for epilepsy. And anyone that doesn't have an urgency, then you need to find a specialist that has an urgency. Okay? You cannot be driving the urgency bus all on your own. You need a whole team of experts that have that urgency to stop seizures. Okay, so our objectives here, we're going to become familiar with the diagnostic process. Uh, process, medical terminology, treatment options, specialty care, learn about epilepsy resources in our community. And through this presentation, I'm going to tell you the story of how our organization has built up from just two to three programs to 30 programs, okay? And you get an idea of you can have an epilepsy support network in your neighborhood if you bring together a collective group of, what's the word? Passionate people. People who really want to make a change, okay? People who have an urgency. Um, so we want to improve the quality of life and increase independence for your loved one by sharing knowledge and community resources. So what we do, oh, I have to stay here because of the filming. I like to walk around. So what we do is if a parent comes to us with a four-year-old child and I say, we have, you know, we're suffering tonic-clonic seizures. We can't stop them. We need to get them stopped. Um, and how can you help? So we're already projecting out to this kid going off to college, okay? So we try to get the seizures stopped. We ask them about, you know, school, academics. Do they need an IEP? Because they need to get back on track. Because what are, what are seizures doing to the brain? Anyone? Anyone? Caitlin? Anyone? What are seizures doing to the brain? It's taking up valuable time for learning and they're missing the learning opportunities, okay? Not only are they missing the learning opportunities, the cells are changing to epile epileptogenic neurons that are gonna want to have more seizures. So they're losing time and they're starting to get behind, okay? So we know that there's going to be stopping the seizures, catching up academically, catching up socially. Um, there are going to be some Maybe some comorbidities, and what are the top comorbidities of epilepsy? Anxiety, depression, okay, and for the older kids and adults, suicide. Because we have to be honest, folks. We got to tell you what the truth is. If your 16-year-old can't get a driver's license because the epilepsy hasn't been taken care of, so at four we're taking care of the epilepsy because we know at 16 they're going to want a driver's license, right? So we, do you see where the urgency is? We back it up all the way from, I know what they're going to feel like when they're 16. I know what's going to happen. So there's an urgency to get back on the developmental milestone schedule. Does that make sense? Because you can't be at 16 and say, oh, now we've got to get these seizures under control. Because it's harder to control seizures in a brain that's been seizing for 15 years. It's easier to control seizures, in most cases, for the brain that just started seizing, because the brain hasn't fully adapted to seizures yet. So the one thing that we have that um, is really difficult to find that's unique and very valuable is we have an extensive knowledge of epilepsy, and we're forecasting out. So we're handling the emergencies today, which are seizures, and we're going to guide you through every, um, every milestone and every um, stage depending on the age of your loved one, to get them shored up in all areas, okay? Because we want that four-year-old then to be in regular ed and not fall so far behind because no one's watching and they go into special ed and they never come out of special ed into regular ed or they never get their driver's license or they never get an opportunity to live independently. So when we're talking about independence, it starts at four years old. We're already trying. So one of the things I want you parents to know is epilepsy can be debilitating and it can be disabling at some point, but we have to be enabling. 
We have to give them every opportunity to succeed where they are. So as parents, we never say, you can't do that because you have epilepsy. It's let me figure out a way so you can do that safely because you have epilepsy, okay? So think about your um, messaging to your kids because we want them to be independent. So we have a teen club, and our teen club is, what we're doing is we're teaching them how to be as independent as possible because what do you think those teens are telling us? Oh, my parents are helicopter parents. They never leave me alone. I can't stand them. They're always looking over my shoulder. I feel so different. Okay. So this is what the teens are telling us. So we're teaching them to take on responsibility, to take their medication. They can take their medication on their own. That's great. Those are steps towards independence. Because we can't wait till they're 18 to have them take over their independence. We're talking four. Okay? So when they're four, we teach them how to do things that are neurotypical. You teach them how to do things safely with epilepsy. Because at five and six, when they go swimming at a friend's house, they have to say, oh, I have epilepsy. I have to ask my mom first and make sure someone's watching me all the time. They can be an advocate at five years old for themselves, right? And if they start advocating for themselves, and if they start taking care of themselves, then that lifts a huge burden off the family. And then everyone advocates, and these kids are going to be advocates, and they're going to take care of themselves. And when, they're, you know, when they go to live independently, some kids are going to go off to college. Some kids are maybe going to stay home for a while. Some kids are going to go into independence building group homes. Okay. And the more independent they are, the better their quality of life. And that's what's important to the person with epilepsy is quality of life and as much independence as possible. Is everyone following me? And when does independence start? Today. Okay. So in our Friday Friends Club and our teen club, we're teaching them about independence. So as they're approaching adulthood, they know as much about independence and what's their responsibility and what's their parents' responsibility. And independence builds self-esteem. Self-esteem is your greatest thwarter of depression and anxiety. So it all fits together, and this is what we teach our parents, and this is the value of our organization, is although we're dealing with today's, um, today's crisis, which is the seizure, if they had a seizure that morning, is we're going to take them through the entire um, stage of epilepsy for that age and help them get, help them have best case scenario at, at every stage. Does that make sense? Any questions before we continue? Okay. Um, so let's talk about what is a seizure. Seizure is a brief, abnormal, excessive, or robust discharge of electrical activity in the brain. And the one thing about epilepsy is you really can't see the discharges happening, so you got to watch for those telltale signs. you got to watch for that faraway look in their eyes. you got to watch for the eyelids that are drooping. you got to watch for the head that nods down a little bit. They look a little tired. you got to watch when they miss your questions, etc. And you have to be asking yourself, are they having subclinical activity, activity that's happening in the brain that you're not seeing, and there are no outward manifestations like jerking or movements, etc.? Um, and that's why an EEG is so important, and that's why epilepsy centers with epileptologists are so important, is because they're going to be looking at that subclinical activity. And you have to diagnose using an EEG and a very good neurological history and many other things um, to diagnose epilepsy and not just seizures observed. You have to have an EEG, and the specialist has to see what the brain is doing. Okay, so we only refer to level four world-class epilepsy centers because when, by the time the kids get to us and they've had two or three seizures or they've been misdiagnosed or on the wrong medication, we know that um, epilepsy um, and seizures, if you don't get, if you don't choose the right medication within the first two medications, then you become um, intractable by the third medication. So it's a tiny little window that we have to you know, make, and that's, again, where the urgency comes in. Okay? So if you failed on two medications, the third medication might not work. The fourth medication you know, 
It's the law of diminishing return. So anyone in this room who has been battling epilepsy for over six months really should be looking at a um, level four pediatric or level four adult epilepsy center to get answers in. Um, you can come to our table, and there are many epilepsy centers out there. You can go talk to them, the closest epilepsy centers to your area, and we can help you with that. And, that's, and that is our value as an organization, is we get people to epileptologists. Does everyone know what an epileptologist is? Who doesn't know what an epileptologist is? Raise your hand. Okay. So my daughter had epilepsy for three years before I knew what an epileptologist was, and I researched everything. I was on the internet. I was asking everyone. And when I found out what an ep epileptologist was, I thought, well, why didn't anyone tell me? Because I would have gone straight to an epileptologist. An epileptologist is a neurologist who studies two to three additional years in reading EEGs, difficult to control seizures, um, syndromes, and treats the most difficult epilepsies and surgical um, candidates as well. So the um, a regular neurologist might see over 900 neurological conditions. And epilepsy is so complex that if you want a really good diagnosis, and your treatment will only work if it's a good diagnosis, so you match up the diagnosis to the treatment, then you have a much better chance of getting your seizures under control or at least getting the right treatment that's going to get the best seizure control. So that's why you want to go to specialists. And that's um, our value is we get people to um, epilepsy specialists. OK. So let's go over what epilepsy is and what epilepsy isn't. So epilepsy is a neurological condition um, and where a seizure is the calling card, right? And tonic-clonic seizures are the only seizures you can really take a look at and say, now that's probably a seizure. Still going to have to go through an EEG and see if see what kind of seizure activity is occurring in the brain. Um, two or more unprovoked seizures um, is epilepsy. It's primarily a pediatric condition lasting into adulthood. One in 50 children, ages newborn to 18 years. One in 100 adults will be diagnosed with epilepsy. One in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy. It is more common than cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis combined. And in the United States, here's why we're urgent, OK? 50,000 people die each year due to a seizure or seizure-related event. So do you really want to work with anyone that's not urgent about epilepsy? No, because we are going to have a direct impact on that figure if we're urgent and if we see specialists, OK? And if it's your loved one, it's very, very, very important. There's nothing that's more important than getting um, seizure control. OK, so my favorite part, diagnosis. How do you get? to the best diagnosis possible? Um, well, you find an epileptologist. And where do epileptologists live? Epilepsy centers, right? An epilepsy center is a comprehensive center, like a cancer center or an orthopedic center, where all of the epilepsy specialists are housed in one department. And you go there, and it's a one-stop shopping place for epilepsy. And all of you deserve it. It, epilepsy is a difficult condition, and you want people who understand epilepsy, who advocate, who believe in you, and are very passionate about caring for people with epilepsy. Um, many, many tests are done. Um, we can't keep up with them because the science is going so fast. But what's really exciting is the genetic testing. So um, back in the day when our kids were diagnosed, there was no genetic testing available. So we were just always, hmm, I wonder what it is. Could it be this? Could it be that? Could it start because of this? And you spend so much time and energy trying to figure out what caused the epilepsy. And now there's genetic testing. And if they don't get the epilepsy under control quickly or they see some markers or indicators, they'll do genetic testing. And in many cases, they can find the gene, the mutation, the abnormality. I'm not saying they're going to be able to fix it. But if you know um, the diagnosis, so you can treat it with um, level one tier, which is the most effective medications. And that's what you want to do. So science is so advanced. So diagnosis is key, because diagnosis gets you to 
um, treatment, and the treatments are medication, surgical evaluations, um, ketogenic diet, best possible seizure control, and those are the most common that most uh, people with epilepsy fall into those groups. Okay. Common causes of epilepsy, well, we used to have the top one, uh, about 30% uh, is because of a brain anomaly that we can see in an MRI, okay? Now we're finding out that, um, that, that genetics and we have um, metabolic issues, mitochondrial issues, there's a myriad of reasons why people have epilepsy and we're finding those out and we just don't have to rely on the MRI to find out why you have epilepsy because that would only tell us if you had a, a brain anomaly. Okay, so triggers. Many families say, I just feel so out of control with epilepsy. Well, parents and loved ones, you have to become your own um, neurological um, leader and supervisor and notice what triggers your loved one's seizures. And when you notice the triggers, you're becoming a scientist because you're looking for indicators, predictive indicators. You're looking for the antecedent. You're looking for what causes seizures. And then you report that to the doctor. Those are really great clues. And then you start eliminating them from your loved one's repertoire. The heat, we know, is a trigger. Most common triggers are, for adults, missed or late medication. That is easy to take care of, OK? For um, children and adults, sleep deprivation and fatigue. That's more difficult, but if you get um, your required sleep, and everyone requires a different number of hours sleep, then that can help prevent seizures. Illness is a big one. So you kind of have to be really militant about if you have children, other kids coming around your kid that are sick. Because if you're at the six-month seizure-free right, you know, um, date, and uh, your sister wants to drop off her kids with a stomach flu for you to babysit, uh-uh-uh, because it's just not going to be stomach flu. It's going to be stomach flu and seizures and more seizures. And nope. So you have, to be, you have to be the gatekeeper and protector, OK? Even colds or you know, flus definitely get to six months, then to a year being seizure-free. And sometimes with generalized epilepsies, the brain learns how to be normal again. And that's why the kids are on medication, is you're trying to regulate normal brain activity and to have the brain forget how to have seizures. The brain's very smart. It remembers. So we have to do everything we can to stop the seizures and then have normal brain activity. So stress anxiety. We're seeing it younger all the time. Stress and anxiety can cause um, spiking and seizures, hormonal changes, um, hypoglycemia, poor diet, missed meals, caffeine, okay? Um, I see a lot of those teenagers drinking those caffeinated drinks that are not good for the brain. And if you have epilepsy, they're really not good. And they can be a trigger. Hyperventilation, flashing lights, drug interactions, um, generic medications. If you go from a brand name to a generic and all of a sudden the seizures are back, that is a case study enough for you to go back to your doctor and say, my loved one had seizure control on brand name, and now on generic they're having more seizures, back to brand name. And they can petition your insurance for you for that and get you back on um, brand name. So be aware of all of these things because this uh, managing triggers and eliminating triggers, it's very powerful for um, reducing seizures. Um, and of course, adolescents, alcohol, marijuana, recreational drugs, and everyone's talking about, you know, um, cannabidiol, medical marijuana. You have to be very careful because there are drug interactions. You don't know what's in it. Read the studies. A lot of the studies say that when, if you're going to buy from your local um, supplier, that who knows what's in that? We now have cannabidiol. Um, and Epidiolex, which is Epidiolex's brand name. And if you have a diagnosis of LGS or Gervais or LGS-like or type seizures, then that's the way you want to go because it's regulated. Does that make sense? And um, we do know that uh, Epidiolex can increase the ONFI levels, and you need 
an epileptologist to really manage that, okay? Do you see where I'm going with this? Everything has a reaction, and we really want specialists following these medications and diagnosis. Okay. Um, impact on epilepsy. Well, if you look at all these things, we can just say that epilepsy has an impact on the quality of life. So what do we do about it? We advocate. We advocate in schools. We advocate at their jobs. We advocate for them and say, the medication sometimes affects learning. The medication sometimes, you know, um, affects uh, the um, sleepiness or somnolence of my child or my loved one. So it is not the person. Epilepsy is part of the person. And we need to advocate in all areas because seizures can affect all of these areas. Does that make sense? We don't want people writing off our loved ones because they have a difficulty in one of these areas. Epilepsy, we didn't choose epilepsy. Epilepsy chose, chose us, and we're going to make the best of it, right? So, and this is how you make the best of it. Okay, so supporting your loved ones, supporting, um, supporting students in school is if you don't have seizure control, and that's the goal, is limiting seizures. Not everyone can get seizure control, but if you can reduce seizures by 50%, then another 5% here, and then another 5% with another medication, or maybe an implant. We are big proponents of getting surgical, neurological, um, and uh, surgical consults for brain surgery if you have focal epilepsy, because we have seen the most dramatic outcomes. And it's not a last resort. It's after the second medication fails. So that's really important to do. Um, but if you don't have seizure control, let's revisit. Let's get to an epileptologist. Let's get to a, you know, maybe a higher level epilepsy center. Um, and let's see how we can do these things, how you can do these things successfully. So a lot of parents, when their kids first get epilepsy, they take them out of school and they just kind of um, hibernate and do nothing. Well. I'm going to tell you, get out there and live large, okay? Because it's not the, um, you know, the quantity of life, it's the quality of life. And your kids want to be around other children. They want to be doing typical things. They want to be doing all those fun things. They don't want to miss out on them. Because if they do miss out on them, you're going to be hearing that for the rest of your life and trying to make up for it, okay? So we try to keep them as neurotypical as possible. So beware of isolation due to overprotection. And encourage independence by including individual in as many activities as safely as possible. So we live in Southern California. We have the ocean and we have swimming pools. So do you think we're going to get away with telling our kids you're not going to swim and you're not going to go in the ocean? Well, guess what? Another reason to get them seizure free, right? If they're going to be swimming, then we have someone there watching them 100% of the time, OK? Um, I put my daughter in surf lessons, and she had a one-on-one -on -one person on a big floaty surfboard, <laughs> not a regular surfboard, and one-on-one, -on -one, he kept her on there, and they just rode that surfboard in and rode that surfboard back. Maybe she didn't get to do all the things the other kids did, but she got to take surfing lessons, okay? And um, they had extra people in the water for her, and I thought it was going to be a big deal, and I thought they were going to say, sorry, she can't do it. But they say, no, we deal with um, kids with special needs all the time, CP, epilepsy, and this is how we do it. And it was so refreshing. Of course, I had my chair right there, and I put a big red bow in her hair, and I sat there on the beach and watched her. Um, but just to have those typical, um, you know, those neurotypical experiences, very meaningful. So how do we advocate for our children? Well, we have a Friday Friends Club, and if, our, if we think our kids are missing out on something, for instance, like they don't get to go to sleepovers, well, then we have a pajama party sleepover at our Friday Friends Club. And they get to, for three hours, pretend they're at a pajama party and sleepover and get to do all those things. So they get to have that experience. If they're not going camping because it's too remotely, then we have a camp night. And they come in, we put up little tents, and they get to experience what it's like camping. So anything that they might be missing out on, is we recreate for them and they get to enjoy it. So when their other friends are talking about going camping or spending the night or doing this, then they get to say, oh yeah, we've done that at my club. 
So they're right in there with the other kids. Same thing for the teen clubs. Our teens wanted to go to the beach to have a bonfire because that's what Southern Californians do. They go to the beach, have a bonfire at night. And so that's the ocean, that's fire, the kids with epilepsy. And so um, in our staff, I said, can we do this? And the staff said, let's huddle. And so we decided we could do it. So every year they get to go to bonfire. The kids that don't have seizure control, they sit in chairs next to the bonfire and they have a one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Because not only have a bonfire, they have those pokey sticks that they put the, you know, marshmallows on. And um, so the, the teens that don't have seizure control, they have one-on-ones. The teens that do have seizure control, we make it very safe for them. We have someone constantly around the fire watching the kids, keeping them about a foot out. If they wanted to do the roasting of the marshmallows, they sit on their chairs. And then we have our staff standing next to them. And all of them were so thankful. I, I mean, it just brought tears to my eyes when I came to pick up the stuff and transport all the stuff back. And they were so happy. And they were thanking us. Thank you. We've never been to a bonfire. My parents won't let me. OK, you do have to get there at 530 in the morning to save one of those bonfires. So it's an all-day event, OK? And I can see why the parents don't do that. Who wants to get up at 530 in the morning and sit on the beach all day, right? But these kids were so ecstatic. And they got to experience a summer beach bonfire. And that's their favorite thing every single year. And if that's all it takes to help them stay in that neurotypical realm, then we're going to do it, OK? So we have passion. We have commitment. And what we try to say is we don't ever try to say no. We try to say, how can we work this out for them? How can we get them to experience what they want to experience, OK? Um, they also want to come to Disneyland one day, but that's just too many. We haven't gotten to that point because there are too many avenues for getting lost and estranged. <laughs> and you know we have to keep them together. So. But we do, we went to, um, we took them to the um, escape room. Have you heard of that? That's what, you know, they tell us what they want. They just went to the pumpkin patch. Um, they get to go on a lot of community outings and they love it. So we try to make those things happen for them. Yes? I have a question about children. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think it definitely, if you don't have seizure control, OK? So the brain's just, the subclinical activity's going off all the time. And the brain is ready to seize at any time. You give it caffeine, it just needed that excuse to seize. Sugar, you know, it's also a stimulant for the brain. Of course, that's going to probably um, cause them to have seizures. But if you do have seizure controls and you bring all of that subclinical activity down, because you're on the right medication due to the right diagnosis, and you have really good seizure control, you probably can have that sugar and be OK with it. And have those mark. Yes. Because we used to, before our kids got seizure control, good control, we had a, um, we helped advocate for a pediatric epilepsy center to come to our um, town. And we were demanding it. And so we got a pediatric epilepsy center. And none of our kids were able to have sugar or caffeine and all these triggers. And so our um, epileptologist said, no, we'll get seizure control and they can have sugar. And even in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that would be the day when my kid can have sugar or caffeine. You know? um, and you know, they were right. They get, them, they get seizure control. And these kids can have some sugar. I'm not going to say a lot of sugar. Um, there's some diagnosis that they can't have uh, sugar, but our kids are, you know, seizure control. Once you get seizure control, we can start advocating for, um, you know, we can start looking at s academics. Parents want to say, behavior, we need to do something about this behavior. We never got past seizure control, but now that we are getting good seizure control in Orange County, we can look at academics, we can look at behavior. We look at social skills now. So our groups, our Friday Friends Club and our Teen Club, they're social skills group where the kids are catching up on their social skills. They're making strides. They're building their confidence in the area of social skills so they can take that back to their school and generalize and get a couple friends. Okay? Because they have been, you know, 
marginalized and isolated, and we work on that with them. So these are the things that we work on, and mental health. Let's take a look at that anxiety. Let's take a look at that depression. Let's take a look at that ADD. You get the seizures, you know, under best possible control, we can start treating the other things and see what's left over. And that has been a luxury that we've never been able to address, and now we're addressing it. And that's where the quality of life really goes up. So that's, again, urgency. The sooner you get the seizures under control, you can start addressing the other thing. And that's really, really important. Yes? You know, one of our adult members, it really helped him. Um, but I think that's kind of something you have to try on your own, like an elimination diet, and try it. You can do that very easily by eliminating gluten for two or three days, you're going to know. But it has helped people. I'm not going to say it's going to get you seizure free, but if it helps you feel better, and it does reduce some seizures, um, and if, if, you know a direct if you see a direct correlation, then go ahead and get tested for it. Um, but everyone has a different metabolic system and different um, you know, mitochondrial processing. So it's interesting what um, genetics is finding. And when we do the genetic tests, it tells you, it kind of gives you a road map on what to do. So, um, but a lot of parents do look at that, OK? Um, so seizure types, focal and generalized. And this is where your epilepsy specialist gets involved. They've just redone the seizure types. And they made it's a little bit more definitive, but a little more complicated. So if the easy seizure types are hard to teach, the complicated seizure types are going to be a little bit more difficult. But when we tell our members, um, you have partial that starts in a focal point or generalized that takes up the entire part of the brain. Now, partial seizures, if you have focal seizures, comes from a focal point. There is an urgency to get it under control because it can spread. And once it starts spreading, focal epilepsy is progressive, and you've got to Treat it very seriously, and you've got to be on top of it and get seizure control very soon. Because once it spreads across um, midbrain, the corpus callosum, and goes into the other hemisphere, it's a generalized seizure, and that could be a tonic-clonic seizure. Once it spreads from focal to tonic-clonic, you can't go back. You'll always have the um, propensity towards tonic-clonic seizures. So. Don't miss your windows. Get the seizures under control as quickly as possible. Um, and know your seizure type. It's very important because focal epilepsies and generalized epilepsies um, require individualized treatment. OK, so the reason why we love epilepsy centers is because take a look at this. These are the seizure types, and these are some of the syndromes. OK, seizure types, syndromes. And these are only the syndromes we took off our database from um, an assortment of the diagnoses that our families have. And so it's complicated. Then you get into the genetic testing. If you go to a um, level four epilepsy center, they can do genetic testing. They can do neurosurgery. They can do everything right there. And it's wonderful. It's easy for you. You're not going to every center and then hoping that the doctors get together and talk about it or read the reports, et cetera. OK, so dual diagnosis, yes. Um, autism, about 30% of kids with autism will be diagnosed with epilepsy. Cerebral palsy, about up to 50%. And Down syndrome, about 8 to 10%. So there are um, you know, co-occurring um, co diagnoses. Um, more about seizure types, seizure first aid, which there are many handouts in seizure first aid, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, we have seizure do's, seizure don'ts, but what I really want to talk about, comorbidities, we talked about that. Take home message, seizures must be stopped as soon as possible. Seizures are detrimental to the brain and its normal development. Seizures cause more seizures. Independence, so as we're looking at the medical condition today. We're forca forecasting out, the goal is independence, okay? So what are we doing every single day towards independence for your loved one? The more independent, the healthier they will be as far as their mental health, OK? Um, and oops, go back. Um, 
Independence is severely compromised. We have to remember that it's commensurate with seizure frequency. Epilepsy centers are the best hope for seizure control, and we are here to help with all of them. And compassion drives our organization to urgently help children, teens, adults find relief from seizures. And then here are our points of inspiration, kids that we have helped and kids that weren't going to make it unless they got seizure control. And um, all of these kids are doing so much better and enjoying the best quality of life they can. And then that's my daughter. And it took 14 and a half years to get seizure free. She saw nine doctors. Ask me how tired I am. But I didn't give up. And the ninth doctor, who I said, what the heck, I'm going to give it a try. She has a really great reputation. Um, I wanted to give up. My husband already said, you're crazy taking your so many doctors. You know, that's, that's the level of support I had at home. Um, and the ninth doctor said, oh, she looked over her records and said, she asked my daughter, she said, do you want to be seizure free? My daughter said, yes. And I said, don't you tell her that unless you can really do it because, you know, the previous eight doctors said that and look where we are. She goes, no, I really think I can get her seizure free. So I took that leap of faith and she's seizure free. She has her driver's license. She drives in a little radius around our house. I don't let her drive a lot because she has some, you know, developmental delays, but she's living the best quality of life she can and that's what's important to her. And that ninth doctor really made the difference. And yes, I am the crazy epilepsy lady because who else would go to nine doctors, carry around their original EEGs and, you know, they were printed out in this stack form back in the day, okay? Now everything is, you know, uh, paperless and, but um, it was worth it. She's happy. She's still alive. She's, she has a job and she is out there living her best life and that's what's most important. So now, questions. Um, she took Depakote that we tried three times before, which was horrific because my daughter would fall asleep on Depakote and her doctor said, you know, she has to be awake to learn. She has to be awake in class. And I go, yeah, that's important. How are we gonna do that? <laughs> and so we had to back off on the Depakote so she can be awake than having seizures. So this doctor said, I'm gonna do Depakote. And I said, okay, I tried it three times before. What are you gonna do differently? And she says, no one has done Depakote like I've done Depakote. And I'm like, okay, let's see it. And that Depakote, which I hated, is now my favorite medication, back on the list of favorite medications. And a combination of Depakote and Zorontin, because my daughter started off with absence seizures, okay? And if we would have gotten the diagnosis right the first time, she would have probably been seizure-free within a year. On Zorontin is the number one medication for absent seizures, childhood absent seizures. Um, they did a, um, they did research. We keep up on the research, um, and that is the number one medication. But the doctors weren't up on the research, and they didn't know, so they were trying everything else, wrong diagnosis, trying all these crazy meds that didn't work. So. Basically, it was a world-class pediatric epileptologist, and there's, um, on the internet, you can go on the web and find the Association of Epilepsy Centers, and they will tell you where all the epilepsy centers are in your area. Now, that doesn't mean they are the best epilepsy centers, but you have an epilepsy center, and if it's a level, you know, one, two, three, or four, and then you have to ask if this doctor's still there, the doctor that brought it to level four, because sometimes they leave and the epilepsy center's still on the website level four, or you can call us, or you can um, call Brad, and he'll help you get to the best epilepsy centers possible. Um, what other questions do you have? You came all the way out here, now's the time to ask your question. Yes, in the back. Yes. Um, Absent seizures can be incredibly devastating because they can happen like every two minutes, every five minutes. So you take that and if they're missing 15% of their day, it's like pause, turn the light on, turn the light off. Turn, so um, 
you just have to advocate. And schools, and an IEP is an individualized education plan, and it's part of um, FAPE, Free and Appropriate Public Education, and those laws protect you. And they have to um, create an educational plan that's individualized for your child. Okay, and that's the federal law. It's a huge deal, and you want to get anyone that has um, the typical absence seizures, you want to get them under control before age, you know, six, seven, or eight because they can turn into tonic clonic. So if you're not at a pediatric epilepsy center, and you've got to find out if they're really absent seizures because they could be focal, but you need to get that diagnosis and you need to get them stopped before they turn into tonic clonic, okay? Because tonic clonic, it's a lot more serious than you have to worry about SUDEP, you have to worry about other things. But what I would do is first, I will tell you right now, you can spend years trying to educate, but if you can get those seizures stopped and slow down, I mean, I spent about $30,000 on reading programs for my daughter. As soon as she got seizure free, she's just like, oh, I can read now. I'm like, gosh, dang it. I, I, if I would have known that, because the experts were saying the same thing. Don't worry, it's just absence. They'll grow out of it. Don't. Well, what do you do in the meantime when they're not learning and they're two years behind, right? So try to get the seizures stopped, and um, it'll make your life so much easier with education and IEPs and goals and objectives and everything. I think they're going to cut me off right now. So any last burning questions? We have our booth. We have our welcome booth. Young man, you have been so patient. What is your burning question? Can you stand up? What trigger seizures? Food dyes. Food dyes. Um, if you're allergic to it, yes, yeah, so you have to get tested for food allergies and see if they can trigger seizures. You can be allergic to some things that will cause you to be more susceptible to seizures. So definitely get that. Talk to your doctor and do some allergy testing. Okay? Yes, one more. We're in the welcome booth, the first booth as soon as you walk in, the booth on the corner. Epilepsy Support Network of Orange County, okay? Right by the info booth. We're behind the info booth. Okay, thank you. I have to go to another presentation. I didn't count how many people they were, so I got to count real quick. Okay, great. Oh, they did? How many were there? Okay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for coming. And continue on your journey and advocate and live the best life that you can with epilepsy. And I have faith in every single one of you. Good luck.